Hello everybody and welcome to the search. Today I'll be talking about ECMON obstetrics. Now, so we're going seriously? Yeah, I'm totally serious. Um, believe it or not, similar to the concept of trauma and pregnancy, I think ECMON obstetrics hasn't been, it hasn't even reached its, its full potential or began to because people make assumptions that because something is morbid, it should be off the table. Well, in high mortality situations, morbid procedures might have a role because I would accept morbidity over mortality any day, like we talked about in the last episode. So let's look at the literature overall, and when you do, the first thing you notice is that there aren't, it's not as robust, certainly, as, as trauma ECMO or as other cases in which ECMO is used. But over the years, from about, I'd say, 1999, 2000, up to this point, we've seen an exponential increase in the number of uh, case reports that are being reported, going from about one every three years to three in one year. And when you look at these case reports, and we look at uh, meta-analyses and case series that have been published based upon them, there are three fundamental situations in which trauma clearly has a role in the obstetric field. The first is a pure respiratory compromise. The second is a hemodynamic compromise with or without a respiratory component. And the third is in post-obstetric or postpartum hemorrhage and what would seem like hemorrhagic shock being the primary concern. In these three situations, when the patient is an extremis, the outcomes from ECMO seem to be more favorable than any other alternative at that point. So let's look at respiratory first. In the respiratory situation, or the situation of respiratory failure more aptly, the case reports seem to, in summary, talk about extremely severe but potentially reversible respiratory failure, with many of the examples being H1N1, MERS, and SIRS. I think it's only a matter of time before we see our first coronavirus, or a novel coronavirus, or COVID-19 case that's pregnant being put on ECMO. Recently, there was a report on television of the first ECMO case in China with COVID-19 that had uh, survived and recovered, even in the context of CPR. And that tells you how powerful ECMO can be in the correct circumstances. I'm going to resist talking further about uh, the coronavirus, novel coronavirus, or COVID-19, because A, it's out of my specialty, and B, I think that everybody else is doing a far better job than I can. The second respiratory situation, which seems to respond extremely well to ECMO, relatively speaking, is intractable acidosis with a hypercapnia component, i.e. a ventilation problem. And uh, the most apt of these is probably an amniotic fluid, aneur uh, amniotic fluid embolism or a DVT manifest in a pure respiratory manifestation without cardiac compromise. And the third is intractable ARDS, where uh, all other uh, forms of uh, therapy have failed to produce adequate response within a set period of time. Now, when you look at these things, the data is actually extremely interesting. First, um, in general, mortality is relatively low. In general, uh, the um, uh, mortality rate is about 28% uh, in, in both uh, infant and in, in, in the mother. Uh, and this extreme, seems extremely uh, favorable. Uh, the ECMO complications are no worse than the ECMO complications reported in the literature, varying between uh, 25 and 57%. Uh, the vast majority of cases, uh, VV ECMO was employed, um, both in this series by uh, Ansemi et al. and uh, in this meta-analysis as well. They both seem to uh, mirror each other's uh, outcomes. Uh, 
in terms of a high 70s survival rate, uh, in terms of a um, duration of ECMO that was extended up to 57 days in certain cases, although without maternal viability, unfortunately, but really heroic uh, uh, wide gamut of, of resuscitation efforts. Um, the, the longest in the series where a patient had been put on ECMO, I believe, reported in the literature was uh, 35 days. It was the Panarello study. I think it's up there. Yeah, it is. It's up there. I've included it. And in the, in the Panarello paper, it was a, a case report. And despite everything, both the mother and the child were alive after 35 days of ECMO. Right, which tells you how powerful this technology is if it's used correctly, judiciously, and early enough. The second situation is the situation of hemodynamic compromise. Now, uh, anybody who's worked in a fetal maternal unit recognizes that hemodynamic compromise might seem like a pure cardiac problem, but the reality is that you're looking at refractory left ventricular uh, failure secondary to peripartum cardiomyopathy. You're looking at valve issues during pregnancy. You're looking at synthetic or prosthetic valve issues during pregnancy previously uh, implanted with no problems because there is some ventricular remodeling that does occur during pregnancy. You're looking at drug induced such as bupivacaine intoxication requiring CPR. Don't tell me it doesn't happen. If you're in the obstetric business, you've seen it happen. Okay. You're talking about right to left uh, biventricular failure, secondary to massive embolic events, amniotic or deep venous. And uh, you're talking about, in reality, any CPR situation, okay? In those situations, again, the literature does not have a clear answer. But the biggest case series that I could find was from uh, the New York Presbyterian Hospital. And as you can see, they have a wide gamut of patients. The vast majority of them are ARDS patients. But that's true of most ECMO pathologies that are studied by population as opposed to by pathology, right? And in the vast majority of these cases, what seems to be clear is that VA ECMO in this particular population with hemodynamic compromise does have a role. And the complications mirror those of other series. But VA ECMO versus VV ECMO, where you just decompress the right side. I know that you're not technically decompressing the right side with VV ECMO. But what I'm really trying to say is your right ventricle has to produce less work, has to rely on less oxygen. The oxygen requirements go down, and so therefore the rate of recovery and reperfusion is far better, and the overall prognosis of the right side of the heart is better. That's what I'm really trying to say. Um, I can give a whole talk on cardiac physiology at some other date, but, you know, y'all would fall asleep, let's be honest. In those cases, I think VV ECMO might work just as well, even in hemodynamic compromise, if the patient is caught early enough and if it's transient enough. And the case series, however, don't reflect that. What the case series tend to reflect is that if, if you have a peripartum problem, VA ECMO leads to better outcomes overall. And I think that that's the way that we're going but I think that you should be cognizant that if, if, you, if you're if you confident and competent enough to start with VV ECMO and transition to VA ECMO in your center, it might be a good option for you, especially as you first start off this practice, because it's not easy to organize the logistics of an ECMO circuit in a pregnant lady with a primarily uh, shock or high shock problem and a high risk of bleeding. The third situation is actually postpartum. It's postpartum hemorrhage. And in that situation in which the patient receives more than 8 to 10 units of blood, there isn't that much data, but the data that is there is from two different sources. And it seems to be fairly clear that in patients who seem to be intractable with extremely high levels of coagulopathy, some of them requiring hysterectomies, ECMO does play a role and produces better outcomes than those that are reported in the literature. Now, technical considerations particular uh, to pregnant women. In pregnant women, uh, given the IVC changes, given the vasoplegic changes, given the cardiac changes, given the changes in systolic blood pressure, and that 20% of the cardiac output goes to the fetus, uh, 
using TEE guided resuscitation and volume status adjustments just makes sense given the general principle of ECMO. Now, uh, this is a cartoon of an ECMO circuit, and it's just to delineate the fact that your oxygenator is pump dependent, your pump is dependent on something to pump. And a fair percentage of what you're thinking that you're going to pump is actually crossing the placenta right now. That's your situation, pregnant woman. Also, when you're positioning uh, your patient in order to put the cannula in, be cognizant that you have to have a left lateral decubitus position, or it would be preferred, particularly if you're going for femoral venovenous access sites. I think given the consideration of the possibility, very strong possibility of a cesarean section, you might not want to go for a femoral access necessarily if you can. But if that's what you're comfortable with, Note that your guide wire is just as likely to turn around and land in the elder iliac vein, the contralateral iliac vein, as it is to land in the IVC, unless you have a lateral de decubitus position. Okay? And obviously, never deploy your catheter blind. Once you put the guide wire in, recheck with ultrasound that it's actually in the IVC, please. The other technical consideration is fetal viability. Now, when fetal viability is compromised, and um, a miscarriage has occurred or is imminent. And um, you have to perform a, 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 an evacuation. Pharmacological means seem to land people in problem if you look at the literature. The, the literature is rife with retained products when pharmacological means are used in such sad situations. And it is unfortunate when it happens, but a dilatation and curatage is probably the best way to go if that decision is made, as opposed to pharmacological means. So that's it for today. Uh, this is Saud Azid. Thank you for listening. And be sure to subscribe.